I would like to welcome the next speaker for side proposition, Sam Hunt. Sam is a first-year student reading classics at Pembroke College. He won this slot through open audition. Sam, you have the ear of the hat. This House believes that the House of Windsor is failing. First of all, I would like to pay my thanks to the second speaker for the proposition for her fine speech. Um, and, uh, I mean, you, you said at one point that you thought that failing equated to a downward trajectory. Yes, I think that is the perspective of all three of the speakers on side proposition. But we are prepared to be a broad church, and we're more than happy to welcome somebody who believes it's been failing since 1917, or if you want to go back further, 1689 or even 1066. You said that it remains to be an institution of, an, of oppression, and it was doing as great a job as as ever at being really crap. Those phrases remains and as ever. You just think it's been failing for a very long time. You situate your definition of failure within a longer time frame. Join us. I'm sure Mark Fran I'm I, I'm sure Mark Francois won't mind. He is, after all, no stranger to partisan division. He's relatively inured to that sort of thing. Uh, but on a, on a rather more serious note, uh, you did exemplify the malaise, the disenchantment that many people, including many people judging by the cheers in this house, have with the royal family. This belief that over the years it has gradually evolved into an almost exclusively ceremonial institution and it, not, it doesn't even serve any practical discernible purpose anymore and therefore surely a system whereby automatic right of access to public subsidy is guaranteed simply by circumstances of birth is an awkward and incongruent extravagance in 21st century Britain. So let's abolish it. There was a, one of the floor speeches described it as a farce. Consequently, the failure or indeed the success of the House of Windsor depends upon the capacity of its individual members to embody the case for the preservation of a primarily ceremonial institution. Given the contextual peculiarity of the House of Windsor's status and the means by which we maintain it, ceremonial royalty is an historic relic. It is paradigmatically unique. And for years, we have all endorsed this alternative universe of rights, privileges, and entitlements. But now, various senior members of the royal family have started to deconstruct this alternative universe from which they get their justification, deconstruct the boundary between them and us. And they do this primarily by over-publicizing, humanizing, and monetizing the monarchy. In 2015, a number of Prince Charles's letters to senior British politicians like Tony Blair and Lord Irvin were published after, under an FOI request. And whilst the contents of the so-called Black Spider memos was pretty innocuous and harmless, the Prince of Wales had still compromised the ideal of the heir to the throne's impartiality. In terms, of the late, in terms of the Prince Andrew debacle, the thing that surprised me most about it was that it wasn't the revelations about his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein which decisively trashed his career as a public figure. Instead, it was the interview that he subsequently conducted with the BBC. It wasn't so much the allegations as it was his over-eagerness to appear publicly. And this, this culture of excessive self-exposure is something that's been relatively endemic in the royal family for the last couple of years. Some of you may remember in 2017 the release of an HBO documentary called Diana, Our Mother, Her Life and Legacy, when Princes Harry and William um, notoriously decided not to impose any guidelines on the filmmakers, the result being a very raw, a very raw series of emotional interviews. The Duke of Cambridge said at the time that he hoped it would help to humanize the royal family. And so it did. But we on side proposition believe that humanizing and demystifying oneself, much as they may be sensible media strategies for an elected politician, are uniquely damaging for an institution whose existence depends on all of us consenting to their exemption from the loosely meritocratic framework of the professional world within which the rest of us operate. In other words, when royals try to uh, disclose to the public their opinions, their emotions, their humanity, they inevitably incite the question, hmm, well, if as you say you're just like all of us, why are you in receipt of privileges to which none of us will ever have access? 
The House of Windsor is degenerating into a kind of glorified celebrity dynasty. It was Princess Diana who first described it as the firm, and never has that terminology seemed more appropriate. Not only are details of the recent royal crisis talks plastered all over the front pages of all the tabloid press, but Harry and Meghan have also decided to set up their own brand, Sussex Royal. Isn't that nice? Not only does Sussex Royal sound like a kind of Waitrose own brand luxury potato, <laughs> but, it, but, it also, but it also embodies Harry and Meghan's surrender of the quasi-feudal loyalty which the House of Windsor has commanded for so long, predicating their new identity, not on their royalty per se, but rather on the abstracted marketability of this asset. Now, there's a fairly obvious rebuttal to the point that I've just made, namely that royal merchandise goes back a great many decades, from my grandmother's George VI coronation mug to all of that organic food that Prince Charles sells under his duchy brand. Why, you may ask, is Sussex Royal any different? It is different because at the same time Harry and Meghan have chosen to relinquish their various royal obligations, thereby proving to the world that royalty as a monetized concept can and has been divorced from the ceremony and rituals which for so many people give our royalty, our monarchy, its justification. In other words, for many years the House of Windsor has used capitalism to serve and popularize monarchy, but now, it uses, now monarchy is being used to serve capitalism. So, when senior members of the royal family try to stress the commonalities between them and their subjects, and when they take notional royalty and sell it like some common or garden celebrity, they create a kind of constitutive tension between what they once were and still purport to be and what they have in reality become. In other words, they take the magnifying glass and thrust it upon the flimsy logic of their own position. Walter Badgett was mentioned in the first, speak for, the first speech for the proposition. I'd like to quote again from the English Constitution in which he says of the royal family, its mystery is its life. We must not let in daylight upon magic. As we reflect on this idea, I think it is the right juncture to bring the queen into this little cocktail of royal degeneration. Because, uh, because as was mentioned in one of the floor speeches for the opposition, I, effect, I effectively hold her relatively guiltless of most of the charges which I have leveled tonight. She rarely ever does interviews, she only speaks to camera once a year during the Christmas message. In other words, she maintains that essential distance between her and her subjects which gives her her authority and consequently her favorability ratings are the highest of any member of the family. Not only are they the highest, they are also more crucially the most stable. However, that means that the queen is the example cited by the opposition that proves the rule of the proposition. And she cannot, she cannot keep the royal family from failing. Not least because, and I hope I do not commit treason when I point this out, she is a 93-year-old woman, and she cannot live forever, much as I would dearly love her to do so. And, 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 and consequently, the future of the House of Windsor is very much in the hands of the people who have occupied the bulk of my speech tonight. So, to sum up, the House of Windsor hasn't failed but it has cast daylight upon magic. It has started to treat the media and the public as a celebrity or a politician would. It has started neutering the justification for its own existence, and if it continues to do so, then it will slide into the obscurity of the royal houses of somewhere like Sweden or Japan, if not a state of eventual abolition. And that is why I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for that eloquent speech.